Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the podium Gabriel Walker, the founder of Valence Solutions and the founder of Rethinking Removals. Thank you. It was quite the conversation and it was good crack, so thanks very much for that. And to MHD. Oh, she's so. Irish. <laughs> she's crack properly. <laughs> I am actually a dual citizen, British and Irish, so it's very good to be home. Thanks for inviting me. So I'm actually here to talk about something that you all know a lot about already. So how can I possibly do that? Tell you something that's going to uh, show you uh, sustainability and climate change in a slightly different light. I'm going to give it a crack. And uh, I'm starting with this picture. It's a quite weird way to start a, a, a conversation, a, a lecture about climate change. Um, that is actually me. Um, and I'm out in the, the wee small hours of the morning, as I sometimes do, looking at beautiful things in the sky. Uh, go on then, what am I looking at? What's that white dot in the top that I'm looking at? Any guesses? Anyone? Is it, is it a planet? Oh my God, that's the fastest anyone's got it. It is the planet Venus. Congratulations, ladies and gentlemen. That was really quick. It is the planet Venus. Why am I starting this talk about uh, climate change with a picture of me looking at the planet Venus? I'll show you. Now, this is um, the, the Earth, my favorite planet. It's very lovely. It's got water. It's got green things. It's got life. It's a very comfortable temperature on the surface, around, around the sort of 20, 25 degrees mark. Um, this is Venus. And uh, it's actually to scale. Venus is, is it almost exactly the same size as Earth. It really is our sister planet. And it's actually, it's, it's pretty similar distance from the sun. It's a little bit closer to the sun. So you'd expect it to be a little bit warmer and the Earth to be a little bit colder. But in fact, it's not just a little bit warmer. Venus, the surface of Venus is hot enough to melt lead. It's 450 degrees C. And you can ask yourself, it's actually a hellhole. You can ask yourself, why is there such a big difference between these two planets when otherwise they are so similar? And there is one difference, ladies and gentlemen. It is that greenhouse gases in the atmosphere Venus has very substantial amounts of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and this is what happens to a planet when you do that. I just want us to remember that, because I'm going to talk now about climate change. And we've all been talking and hearing this morning about, about renewable energy infrastructure and why we're doing it and how we need to be more urgent and stuff. I'm going to put some, some flesh on those bones for you. So, it used to be, of course, that ESG, climate, all of this stuff was really for tree huggers. It has mainstreamed. It has started to become something. It really seems like it's there for business. And this is why. This is Sarah Breeden from the Bank of England. And she said this earlier this year. She said, climate risks are uncertain but predictable. And listen to this. They will affect every consumer and every corporate in all sectors and in all geographies. That is why we're talking about climate change. It's a massive financial risk. It's a massive risk to business. It's a massive risk to financial stability. It's material. And uh, when um, Mark Carney was still governor of the Bank of England and chairman of the Financial Stability Board, this is how he characterized it. Climate change presents significant risks for global financial stability for two reasons, direct physical risks and risks from transition costs. I'm going to take those two in a row. You'll see things that you already know, but just bear in mind Direct physical risks and risks from transition costs are direct material risks to doing business in a climate change era. Okay, first of all, direct physical risks. Now, this is going to get a bit ugly, so you have to brace yourself. What I'm talking about is direct physical risk to assets, to infrastructure, to things that are essential in your supply chain, to things that can actually get burnt down or flooded or can stop production and therefore have a material risk to your ability to do business. So I'm starting with temperature. This is starting in 1880. It's obviously a map of the world. And it's going to show you how temperatures have changed since the 1880. This is actually showing you how variable our temperatures really are. If it gets a bit bluer, it's going a bit colder somewhere in the world. If it gets a bit yellow or redder, it's going a bit warmer. Let's see what happens. So that was actually quite a cool period. It's, it, was, it was really quite cold for large parts of it in the early 1900s. Um, then a bit of a flicker of, of warmth in the, in the north in the 20s and 30s then. And then it kind of goes a bit colder again. See how variable it is. It's amazing. It goes colder, warmer, colder, warmer. All the way through, we're in the 60s and then the 70s. And then we get to the 80s. And then we get to the 90s. And then the 2000s. And the 2010s. It's not subtle. It's not subtle, and it's not something in the future, and it's not something for our grandchildren, and it's not something that we worry about if we want to be nice to the planet. It is here, and it is now. And I want you to take that away with you today. 
So, I'm not going to show you that again, but I am going to show you this. So, earlier this year, we had that incredible heat wave across India and Pakistan. India was even worse hit. So, 40, 50 degrees C in India, unprecedented heat waves in India. Um, this is uh, the Yangtze River. Oh, you know, it doesn't look much like the Yangtze River, does it? Almost nobody seems to be talking about this, and I don't quite understand why, because China has just experienced a heat wave even worse than the one that went across India and, and uh, Pakistan. Right? And, and, and it, was, it was spectacular because it was the broadest geographically that China has ever experienced. It was the highest in terms of temperature increase that China has ever experienced, and it was the longest in time that China has ever experienced. And one of the consequences was that the rivers started drying up. The rivers started drying up, which meant that the hydroelectric plants were actually switched off, which meant that the power was switched off, which meant that manufacturing couldn't happen, which meant that it was exacerbating the supply chain, uh, exacerbating the supply chain crisis we already have, China being the manufacturing centre of the world. And then on top of that, because of the heat wave in China, there was also a reduction in food production in China, which exacerbating the food crisis that we're already experiencing. And that's right now. Then there's the fires. You know, when I used to do this, uh, I've been actually talking about climate change, God help me, for 20 years or so. And I used to find it hard to find pictures to illustrate what I said was going to be coming. Now it's actually hard to choose. Which, which fires, which forest fires, and not just forest fires, which fires are sweeping the world? The places in California that are getting letters through their letterbox saying, your home, your business is no longer insurable against fire. Or Australia, or Sweden, or Russia. This is actually Canada, where one particular village after three days of plus 45 degrees C temperatures, spontaneously burst into flame. I told you it got, got bleak. Uh, it's going to get better. Stay with me. It is going to get better. But we've also got food shortages now because of the droughts, like the one that I mentioned in China. And that has other consequences, geopolitical consequences, consequences for business beyond just food, because you also get migration. And think about the impact, the geopolitical impact that the migration has already had on Europe. And the people migrating into Europe from North Africa and from Syria, there's lots of reasons why there's those wars taking place in those particular arenas. Lots of very complicated historical reasons. But I just make the comment that both of them started with a prolonged drought. And I spoke to a military general who said, you know, the kind of migration that we're seeing at the moment is a walk in the park compared to what we'll get if we really let climate change take hold. And here's an example of that. Because right now, did you know that right now Pakistan is experiencing very dramatic floods? So, you know, you kind of hear this. I, I, I got sent messages about it. Yeah, I know there's floods everywhere, blah, blah, blah. And then I had another look at it and went, wait, what? 33%, a third of the country. Pakistan is not a small country. A third of the country is underwater right now. 40 million people have been displaced right now. This is climate change that's here, and it's real, and it's with us, and it's having a dramatic impact already. And we haven't, by the way, even got to 1.5 degrees. So here's a mega hurricane. You know, the hurricanes are beginning and getting stronger, blah, blah, blah. Lots of, lots of big, bad hurricanes around the Caribbean and stuff. Um, I was talking about this in 2019 in, in uh, Toronto to a bunch of retail investors. And I said to them, you know, blah, 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 this particular hurricane. And one guy came to me afterwards and said, you shouldn't have chosen that hurricane. You should choose this one, Hurricane Dorian. And I said, why? Why pick that one? And he said, I used to have a house in the Bahamas. He said, I don't anymore. He said, I used to be a climate denier. Those are his words. He said, I'm not anymore. He said, it looked like a nuclear bomb had hit it. And actually, that's a good analogy because the amount of heat energy we're putting in the atmosphere at the moment is the equivalent of four Hiroshima bombs worth of energy every second. That's what we're doing with the, with the fossil fuels that we're burning. So you can say that bad storms happen all the time, heat waves happen all the time. How do you know that this is actually something that's different and real? So look at this, Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines 2013, the strongest tropical storm ever recorded in the Eastern Hemisphere. Hurricane Patricia, Mexico 2015, strongest tropical storm ever recorded in the Western. Cyclone Winston, Fiji 2016, strongest tropical storm ever recorded in the Southern Hemisphere. We are seeing patterns now that we cannot ignore. Okay, so... <laughs> Bit of light relief here. Who the heck's that? 
It is Lance Armstrong, obviously. Why on earth do I have a picture of Lance Armstrong in the middle of all this? Apart from just to get away for a moment from all this terrifying stuff, he's holding up seven fingers for the seven times he won the Tour de France. And you can ask yourself, you know, which of those times that he won was because he was on drugs, he was on steroids, he was cheating? Which of those seven times? Was it the first one? Was it the third one or fourth one? More sensibly, you could say, by taking steroids, he was making all of those wins more likely. And ladies and gentlemen, with the fossil fuels that we've been burning, with the, the, the uh, agriculture we've been doing, with the ways that we've been doing business, with the ways that we've been making energy, we have been putting our atmosphere on steroids. And we are now making all of those so-called natural disasters very much more likely. So that's why, yet again, there was yet another set of headlines and yet another IPCC report. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, it's science, you know, it's a code red for humanity. And it's actually quite easy to look at that and go, yeah, yeah, I kind of know that. We're just trying to do our job. And what I wanted to say in all of this, when we're talking material financial risk, we're talking material risk to assets, it's not anymore a kind of, yeah, I know, we know. It's really got serious, it's got real, and it's got now. So that was the risk from physical risk, direct physical risk, risk from transition costs, because we are not the only people who've noticed that. And already, this transition is underway, as you all know. So what are the risks from transition costs? I'm going to pick on something, it's a bit unfair. Pick on coal. It's easy to pick on coal. What's going to strand? I used to be talking about how some assets are going to strand. Be careful how you're investing. Look at the way the world's going. You know, in 2020, Peabody wrote off 1.5 billion from the world's largest coal mine in the USA. Coal is coming back in different ways, and I'm, I'm happy to talk about that when, when we talk later. But I just wanted to mention these things. Last year, G7 and China both separately agreed to stop all new financing for overseas unabated coal. If it's not abated, it doesn't get money from the G7 or from China. And then in 2020, oil and gas companies reported all those downgrades. The, the energy system is complicated. We know what's happening now. But I'm just saying already, it's not saying things are going to strand. It's that things are already stranding. And it's not just assets that will strand. It's business models that will strand. It's how a regulation's changing. It's how a consumer appreciation changing. It's how a international agreement's changing. And it's also, you know, how are, how are investors changing in their appetite for where the risks might go? So... Uh, Larry Fink, CEO of BlackRock, uh, he actually said in January 2020, climate change has become a defining factor in companies' long-term prospects. I believe we're on the edge of a fundamental reshaping of finance. A fundamental reshaping of finance, not a kind of let's tinker around the edges, but a fundamental reshaping of finance, and that's over the next 10 years. I'm going to romp through that in a moment. But first of all, I just wanted to say something quick about the crises we've been encountering. This is where the news, in a way, starts to get a bit better even though I'm talking about crises. Because I asked myself the question, is this energy transition robust? We know we need to do it, we know what needs to be done, but is it actually robust because we're being hit by all these crises? Is it being shoved onto the back burner? And Larry Fink asked the same question. He said, in January 2021 in his letter, he said, in March, the conventional wisdom was a crisis would divert attention from climate, but just the opposite took place and the reallocation of capital accelerated even faster than I anticipated. The pandemic has reminded us how the biggest crises, medical or environmental, demand a global and ambitious response, January 2021. We heard this in the previous panel as well. And I've been asking lots of the businesses I work with, I work at, at C-suite level with lots of global businesses, and they have not let up on their climate action. And I've said, why? Why didn't, why didn't the pandemic give you the excuse to let up? And they said two things. First of all, we know this transition is underway. We know we need to get ready for the 21st century properly. We had resets in our plan over the next five to eight years. And now we have an opportunity to do it. We'll do it sooner than we can get with the program. And the other thing they said, investors have not let up their pressure. They have increased it. The pressure from investors who are worried about the financial risk to their investment is now uh, inexorable. And then, of course, along comes the Ukraine war. I don't have time to talk about it in detail. You all know probably more about this than I do, but I just want to make one observation about it. Of course, it's triggered this massive energy security crisis. And what I've been hearing as well, you know, there's, there's the, the rising gas prices, there's the, the issue with, uh, you know, rising uh, electricity prices, there's the, the, the shift in oil, there's the, the, the race to LNG, there's the race to coal, there's never mind about climate, we just need to get energy, right? That's, that's the story of the Ukraine crisis. But not entirely, because I've also been hearing this phrase, not just energy security, as we have in the title of this conference, energy sovereignty, the need for energy sovereignty, 
I think within the European Union, there is a kind of we share energy, but we have a border and we need to worry about where our energy comes from and, and uh, how uh, we, we, uh, we get our vital resource from friends rather than from enemies or from potential enemies. So this thing about energy sovereignty means make your energy where you are and not importing it from countries whose values you don't share and who might make you vulnerable, which, of course, drives towards renewable energy. So there is a kind of short, medium-term look at things like LNG, but there's a very strong push now from an energy sovereignty, energy security point of view with renewables, which is good news. Then there's the supply chain crisis. All of this, you know, the, the, the Pentagon has long said that uh, climate change is a threat multiplier, and of course it makes the supply chain crisis worse. But also this focus on the resilience of the supply chain is also uh, giving, a, I think, a whole different view of how we work with our suppliers. And that's been a necessary and vital part of the whole climate story. It's not enough to say we're dealing with our own emissions, even our own country's emissions. It's where does the stuff come from? And I'm going to say a bit more about that in a moment. So a very quick observation about the, the COPs. I'm happy to talk about it later if you want to. I was there in Glasgow, the next one coming up in, in uh, Sharm El Sheikh. But just the role that businesses have played in pushing for action from governments is extraordinary. That's the thing that was striking in COP in Glasgow. The governments are still messing around, they still can't, handle, can't get the agreement. And, and, and business after business, sector after sector, finance sector particularly leading, we're saying, we're doing this already. We know it has to happen, we're doing it already. And that, that's really inspiring, and that's a message for all of us in this room. Because there is a who's going to fix this, and the answer is, we are. So, quick comment on net zero. Net zero has gone rampant. Another piece of good news. And so now, you know, a, a few years ago, if you said something about net zero by 2050, people looked at you, looked at me like I was a crazed hippie. And now, if you don't have a net zero by 2050 target, you're not at the table. And if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So the, the rise of net zero, and in fact, now it's more than 80% of global GDP generators either have their own net zero by 2050 target or are in a territory that has a net zero target of its own. And it's not just about 2050, of course, it's about today. So look at this. The USA's NDC is a commitment to 50% or more reduction from 20, uh, 2005 by 2030. Ireland, this is legally enshrined. The USA one, of course, is not. Ireland legally enshrined 51% by 2030. EU emissions reduction also legally enshrined by 55% by 2030. UK emissions also legally enshrined uh, by 78% by 2035. These are very big numbers. This is very hard. So it's also looking pretty inevitable. This is the hedge funds are on this. Look at him, Pierre Anderon. We're comfortable, he says, over a five-year horizon that the EU carbon price has to go up. That's pretty much a guarantee. The hedges are saying this is a one-way bet now. And that's yet more evidence. This transition is real. It's happening. It cannot be stopped. And then look at this. This is the, 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 when Mark Carney was still governor of the Bank of England. The, the joint governments of the bank, governors of the Bank of England and the Bank of France sent out this letter. They said this thing about carbon emissions have to de de decline this much. In, a, in what I think is a big understatement, this requires a massive reallocation of capital. But then look at this. If some companies and industries fail to adjust to this new world, they fail to exist. This is now very real in the business world. So I want to show just a couple of things that we might pick up on in the, in the conversations. One is thinking about embedded emissions. If you're in the construction industry, thinking about embedded emissions, it's now becoming clear that it's not just about what happens to the thing you build. It's, it's the, the emissions that, that were used to create it in the first place. 8% of global emissions come from steel. Uh, also concrete. This is a house in a set of houses in, uh, in Norway where they're designed not just to be net positive in terms of the use, but also of the emissions that they contain in their concrete. Also this, this is very interesting, a Getting to Zero Coalition, a new uh, approach to getting, net, uh, getting zero emission ships on the high seas at scale by 2030. This is a coalition aiming to do this, and I think they're going to do it in eight years. And the way they're doing it is they're working right across the value chain. They've got the banks, they've got the ship owners, manufacturers, they've got the, uh, the, the owners of the cargo, they've got the uh, providers of the fuel, everyone working together to figure out how to do it, a new kind of collaboration. Also, of course, hydrogen. We might talk a bit more about that later, but this has gone from being something that might be good for passenger vehicles at some point to something that really could be right across the energy transition, very big, exciting area. 
But the final thing, and just the last minute or two that I'm going to speak to you, is something I've been working on a lot, and it is carbon removals. John Kerry said in April 2021, even if we get to net zero, we still need to get carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and that's a bigger challenge than a lot of people have grabbed onto. It is. Microsoft are already on this, as well as saying they're going to be carbon negative by 2030, they said they're going to remove their historical emissions by 2050, and they also have this $1 billion climate fund. So how do you do it? How do you take CO2 back out of the air and keep it out? You can do it with trees. Trees are great carbon capture machines. And in fact, I did a TED talk on this if you want to run and watch it. But the uh, problem with trees is they burn. And the CO2 goes back into the sky. It's not a long-term solution for capture of carbon. You can, catch, you can get the wood and you can put it into buildings. It's great. It displaces, uh, uh, displaces uh, cement, which is a big polluter. It uh, locks the carbon up in the building. And also, they are beautiful. You can also take it directly from the air. These are two, <coughs> skipped over there. This is a big plant that's being built in Texas that's going to remove a million tons of CO2 a year and put it, I love the poetry of this, it's like reversing the valve, it's going to put it back where the Texas oil came from. A million tons a year, and it's the first large-scale commercial plant of what I think are going to be many. And this is a plant in Iceland doing the same thing. I'm going to finish off with this, because this plant in Iceland I thought was really amazing. I actually went to visit it a couple of weeks ago. And it's doing two things. First of all, there's, there's a hydrothermal power station. So the hydrothermal power station, which is getting hydrothermal power, providing all the electricity and all the heating for downtown Reykjavik. So that's the reduction part. We need to get emissions down as fast as we possibly can. And then on top of that, on the back of it, they're taking CO2 out of the sky using the energy from the power station. And then they're using the, the wells that the power station uses to put the water back into the basalt to inject the CO2 back down again. So this says we need to reduce as fast as we can, and we need to remove CO2 from the air happening in one glorious place. It's just a start. But I think this is a really exciting area, and also it's going to be very big. But at the moment, we're removing maybe 100,000 tonnes from the atmosphere every year. And now, by 2030, we need to increase that by a factor of roughly 10,000. So this is going to explode in everybody's faces very soon. Watch out for it. But the other thing I finally wanted to mention about Iceland is this glacier. I went to visit it. Well, at least I went to visit where it used to be, because this is what it looked like in 1986. And this is what it looked like in 2019. It was gone. This is the Ock Glacier in Iceland, and it has gone. And the Icelandic people being what they are, they actually they made a plaque, a funeral for the glacier. I climbed up with the person who wrote the words in this plaque, the, very, the plaque, the very brilliant Andre Magnusson. I climbed up over the rubble that it had left behind to see the plaque that they have left from this disappeared glacier. I'm going to finish with the words of that plaque for you. It's a letter to the future. It says, Ock is the first Icelandic glacier to lose its status as a glacier. In the next 200 years, all our glaciers are expected to follow the same path. This monument is to acknowledge that we know what is happening and what needs to be done. Only you know if we did it. August 2019, 415 parts per million of CO2. We do know what's happening and we do know what needs to be done. We are the people who can make it happen. And God help us if we don't. Thanks very much. Thank you, Gabriel. Uh, equal parts terrifying and inspiring, as I promised. Um, can I pick up on a conversation that we had last night? Uh, where you, you did something very unfair. You asked me what's Ireland's superpower, uh, which <laughs> suggests to me that you might hold an Irish passport, but you haven't really tapped into the national psychosis yet of <laughs> running the place down, which is just something that you have to do. So it forced me into a conversation with you where we thought about what we can possibly do. And naturally, you being the queen of carbon removal, that is where our conversation ended up. It is. And what is the enormous business opportunity, environmental opportunity, mm. climate opportunity, 
just waiting off our western shore. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I skipped over it quickly at the end, but let me just let me just sort of emphasise that the messages and, and the IPCC really emphasised this earlier this year in their final report, where they said carbon removals are now unavoidable, and started to calculate how much we're going to need. So what we need to do is we need to get emissions down to net zero by 2050. So that means going absolutely as fast as we can with everything that's possible in the, in the toolbox and more. And then in addition to that, between now and 2050, we need to remove cumulatively, in order to have a fighting chance of keeping below 1.5, we need to remove cumulatively, brace yourself for this number, 200 billion tonnes of CO2 from the atmosphere. So we're currently removing 100,000 tonnes a year, and we need to remove 200 billion to match all of those net zero commitments that everybody's cheerfully making. And that's pretty expensive. It's expensive to do air capture at the moment is of the order of three or $400 a tonne. There are plenty of people who are saying the real price on carbon is going to be not, not what the ETS says it is with the, with the changing energy at market, but how much it costs to take it back out again. How much are we removing at the moment? 100,000 tonnes a year. And there's 200, 200, 200 b b billion. billion. So that we need cumulatively. In, in so that, business terms, this is a growth market. It's a big growth market. It's trillions. It's trillions and trillions of dollars that are going to have to go into this. Now, what can Ireland do? Yeah. So it, has to, it takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of energy to, to capture the CO2 from the atmosphere. And uh, that energy has to be renewable. And then the CO2 has got to go somewhere. So what you need is you need lots of renewable energy and you need an available store somewhere. And then you've got a market opportunity, right? Now, as, as far as available stores are concerned, there's now developments in the North Sea, that perhaps could be in the Irish Sea, certainly around Iceland as well, of, of making stores that you can take CO2 to with ships. So, but the question is, who's got lots of renewable energy, which is, which is potential, but doesn't have an offtake, it doesn't have the, the, the um, industrial emissions to be able to, the, the industrial requirements to be able to, to take the renewable energy. So it's just sitting there, it's the wind's blowing, the waves are moving, but it's not being used. Who's got that? Because at the moment, I think it's not exactly a controversial statement to say that we've dropped the ball on wind energy. It's maybe slightly more controversial to say that we're a long way behind the ball on hydrogen uh, mm. development. This is something that you're saying is a potential for Ireland to, if we got the game together, quick enough, become a world leader? I think it's really exciting because it's, it's, it's really, it, the, the, the numbers are inevitable, the technologies are out there, the ecosystem is incredibly dynamic, but it's all very early stage. This is a time where if you can grab a piece of this and show that you know how to do it, then you're going to be in a much better place than anyone else. Um, we take a very long time to build things <laughs> in this country, particularly energy infrastructure. You've heard that being recited all morning long. Uh, what would you say to us that we need to do on that front? Yeah, it is really interesting. I talked a bit about this last night with, and, and, and uh, Aoife this morning in, in the panel, she, she said a brilliant thing. She said, you know, it's a wild west out there, the developers, and there's also, you know, is this something that should be left to developers? Is this something that's a, that's a national benefit, a national good? What, what, what should be the relationship? If you just say, never mind the, the process, just let them do it. People, we're not in Russia. People have a right to have their say, so it's inevitable that it's going to get snarled. Of course, it's going to take 10, 12, 15, 20, 30 years, because that's how long it takes. And I say I completely understand all of that, but I'd also refer to the vaccines. So, you know, in, in September 2019, <coughs> three years ago, if you'd asked me or anyone else, probably anyone in this room, anyone in the world, how long does it take to make a vaccine? If you've got a new virus, you'd have said 10, 15 years minimum, if you could even make it. And then we had the crisis, and then we got it in a year. So it shows that the, 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 you know, we decide what needs to change to make it faster, we can. In that case, there were advanced purchase agreements. There were still all of the, all of the, 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 the rules about around how to actually test the vaccines and make sure that they're safe. But nonetheless, when we know that there's an urgency, we know how to speed up. And what I'm trying to tell you is, it's now urgent. 20 years ago, it wasn't. And it's now absolutely urgent. And any country that's saying, yeah, you know, it kind of takes us a long time, is going to be out of the game. To borrow a credo from a now very unpopular company, are you saying move fast and break things? <laughs> fail fast. Definitely fail fast. And be flexible and be ready to, to learn from it and move on. Okay. But practical application of that principle, though, 
Would you say right now, if we knew that it was going to take us 10 to 12 years to get an LNG terminal through the planning process and actually commissioned, that we should bother or we should just say, no, that will be a stranded asset a decade from now? We need LNG now, don't we? Yeah. I mean, and, and I think in the, the point is that that whole energy sovereignty point is where do you get your LNG from? You're going to get it from Qatar? rather than Russia, or, or, or depend on the US, and, 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 and who knows who might be elected there, who might suddenly decide that the gas needs to be America first. So if you really want energy sovereignty, and LNG isn't a long-term solution, but it is a short to medium one. So if you can do it fast enough, absolutely. But if you can't do it fast enough, I'm not seeing a, an argument for that. Can you explain sovereignty, or energy sovereignty, as an idea to me, though, please? Because I think, again, it might be a part of the Irish psychosis or condition <laughs> that when we hear... Uh, and this is an idea that I have heard coming from Britain. When we hear people from Britain <clears throat> talking about sovereignty of any kind, we know, oh, God, we're going to get it in the neck before long, aren't we? Uh, what, what, what does it mean? <laughs> does, it, does it necessarily exclude energy solidarity? No, and I, I know I really, that, that was a very sore point that you just touched on there, so I'm going to move swiftly on from, from some of the idiocies that are coming out of my beloved country. Um, but um, but I, I would like to apologise in advance for all of them. <laughs> what, for the next 10 years? For the next, uh, that's, a, that's a big apology. For the, for the next two years, at least. For the next two years, at least. I, I, who knows? Um, but anyway, um, in terms of sovereignty, I, I just think it's interesting that I heard that, because also after the Ukraine war hit, you, we all saw this, the solidarity in Europe, across Europe, and I mean the whole of Europe, I don't just mean the European Union, um, the solidarity was extraordinary. So I think energy solidarity goes along with energy sovereignty. There's a sense that, I, I just started to hear that phrase, and there's a sense that uh, we need to be making our energy in a place that we trust, or, or getting our energy from a place that we know we have a strong relationship with and we trust. And Germany made that mistake with Russia, thinking that, well, if Russia has an economic interest, then they're not going to break it, and they did. But it's not, so it's not just an economic interest, it's where do we have real trust, real relationship, real solidarity. So not Qatar, not Saudi, not Russia, and maybe not the United States? Who knows? I mean, you know, at the moment, I think that Qatar is, a, is clearly has got a lot of natural gas, and I think that, I think that they, they, they seem to be good partners. And, um, and the US is... marginally less odious than the Saudis? I'm not going to comment on odiousness, but I am going to say that it's just, if, if it's a country where you don't share the values and where you might be vulnerable then is it a good idea to put all your eggs into that basket? And the answer is, we've learned is absolutely not. Uh, one of the most profound things that I've heard said here this morning, uh, and it was tellingly said twice, uh, but on both occasions by women, and sorry, if there are any fellows who said it, I might have missed it, I apologise, but I thought it was notable that it came from women. And that was basically, uh, summed up in four words, let's do it together. Oh. I, I wonder, have you any panacea to what seems to be the problem that <laughs> besets this area, this territory at the moment. My solution versus ah, your it's solution. It's so exhausting. We're in such a hurry and it's so exhausting that I find it in every aspect that I'm working with. In fact, it's probably the thing that I spend most of my time doing and trying to unpick because it really is even, you know, like it's, it's, it's my solution, not your solution within all the, the efforts to decarbonize. So it should be solar, it should not, not wind. It should be this, not that. It should be, it should be electrification, not hydrogen. It should be, and then, and then in the whole, in the removal space, which is so tiny, it's still my removal and not yours. And then between them, it should be reduction, not removal. And, and, and really, while- People's popular front of Judea. Yeah, exactly. And while everyone's fighting amongst themselves about who's got the best answer, then the, the world carries on burning. And so it just, it really, it has to be everything on the table and everyone around the table. And I'm not interested in any more saints and sinners narrative. I'll work with anyone who I think can fix this. And, and really, you know, it's, 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 I think purism is really dangerous well, in this okay, as well. But, but how do you address that problem then? Do we have to agree a narrative on what the energy landscape might look like by 2030 or by 2050 in order to remove that competition for ego and resources, it would seem? I do a lot of workshops on this exact topic, and the two things that I've learned that really, really help are, first of all, getting everyone to say what their aim is, what they're trying to make happen. What, what, the, what, what the overall ambition is. And when everyone goes around the table saying, we're trying to get to the net zero, we're trying to solve the climate crisis, and they'll look at each other and go, oh God, I'm trying to do that too. And they know it, but when you hear it, when you, when you absolutely, we have a common goal, then that, a lot of the, the barriers break down. And the other thing that happens is, is if you ask them, and this is gonna sound weird, but you say, what are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? 
Because then it turns out that it's not so much, in many cases, it's not so much ego, ego, I have to fix it, but it's just, I have the responsibility, and if I don't, nobody will. And if you go, well, what does it look like when you do it together? Okay. Then, then it actually releases energy. So it's, it's not competition for financial resource. I think it is that too, but it's like, I, I, I'm only going to get the financial resource, and then if my thing doesn't happen, then we won't solve it. So I have to get the money to make sure my thing happens. But in your conversations with CEOs and financiers yeah. now, is it not apparent to you at this stage that there is an abundance of finance for these projects? It's, it, it doesn't seem to be apparent to them. It's amazing. Okay. And you know, somebody said this wonderful thing about, about, about bankers throwing 50s onto the stage. And it's like, I definitely want to go to those conferences. <laughs> uh, but, but really, there is this, this, I've heard again and again, that the capital is there and is dying to be used. And then there's, and part of the bottleneck is people fighting among themselves. And part of the bottleneck is this attitude that says, no, but it takes a long time. You averted there to uh, COP27 and Sharm el-Sheikh in yeah. November. What's going to happen? So Sharm el-Sheikh is going to be a lot, of, because it's an African COP, it's going to be a lot about uh, something that is really worrying me, which is the amount of money that hasn't gone from, from the developed world to the global south, in spite of all the promises. We've promised 200 billion. Yeah. We haven't even made good on the first 100 no, billion. No, we haven't. And, and so it's going to be a lot about loss and damage. It's going to be a lot about what happened to the money that's supposed to be being invested here. And, and it's going to be a lot about resilience and adaptation for the places that are already, you know, like your Pakistan, that are already experiencing uh, the devastating effects of climate change. Um, so I think that's going to be the focus. But one thing that really concerns me, and, and this is also an opportunity, right? Uh, in, in, so it, there's lots of places in sub-Saharan Africa that are saying, look, you, you burned your fossil fuels. If you don't give us the money to, to leapfrog and to get the new technology, we're going to burn ours. We're going to let our peatlands release their carbon. We're going to burn our resources because we need to develop. And so that's, that's, a, that's a threat. And, and, it, and it's coming out from quite a few DRC has been saying that. Nigeria, well, Nigeria is already doing it, but um, Congo, uh, particularly for the peatlands and for the, resource, the oil resources. But I think that that's actually, there's a, there's a flip side because it's not just aid anymore. There's a real opportunity for investment in, in new infrastructure in, in Africa that could bring serious returns. And I think, you know, I've been, to, I've been working with some people, brilliant people in Kenya, who say, look, we've got, you've got a problem with an aging population. We've got this demographic of these brilliant youngsters who are hungry for work and hungry and, and entrepreneurial, who could be the climate army that's providing these solutions for the world. Are you optimistic? <laughs> I, get this, I get this question a lot, or people will say, how can you be optimistic? How can you come up here with this sunny smile when you put all that terrifying stuff up there? And, and I, the, the thing is, uh, when I You're saw, Irish. I'm Irish. Oh. <laughs> when I saw that plaque, it should be terrifying. I was there with that glacier that disappeared, and I was thinking, you know, there were 50, 50 meters of ice, and it's not there, and, and this is real. I know it's happening. I kind of touched it, and it was actually horrifying. But there was also... Weirdly, and maybe this is the Irish in me, right? It was inspiring. Because I saw those words. It says, we know what's happening and what needs to be done. And so it's like, OK, we know what's happening and what needs to be done. Let's get on with it. It's, it's, it's really, um, I, I don't, I, you know, optimists are people who, you know what, optimism and pessimism, they're both fatalistic. They're, they're, let, me give, let me give you this. They're both fatalistic. Something's going to happen. I have no control over it. And if I'm optimistic, it's because I'm a sunny person. If I'm pessimistic, I'm a miserable person. But I can't change the okay. future. Let, let me reframe the question to you then, please. Are you optimistic that we can be, that we will be the greatest generation, the ones that solve this problem for humankind? Do I believe we will be the greatest generation who have solved? Well, I believe one or two things will happen. Either we do that, or we'll all go down in flames. And so I'd rather do that. So um, you tell me. Can I, do I, do I have, should I? Should I believe this? What do you think? Hands up if, you think, your, if you think we're going to fix it. This is your come by, uh, come to God moment. <laughs> because I, I'm, join not, hands. I'm not going to do it on my own. But really, I'm, I'm absolutely serious about this. We are the ones who will fix okay. it. All right. Don't let me down. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Gabriel Walker.